I have been part of UP. And UP has been a part of me. I was once a student like you, hopeful, young, full of ideas and ambitions. Today, I join you, BATS 2013, a proud and grateful product of the university. Each of us has his own journey to tell, inspiring, remarkable, unique. Mine began in Baler, as Dr. Pacheco said, many moons ago, when it's still part of Tayabas and now Quezon. In those days, Baler was, was as bucolic as it gets, locked in by the rambling Pacific on one side and the majestic Sierra Madre on the other. We regarded them ourselves as neither rich nor poor. We did not have the comforts of electricity and running water, much less the luxury of a movie house. Nature was our only playground. But most local families owned modest farms, and from the land and the sea, we obtained our food and our income. My family has been from Baler, or has been of Baler, from as far as anyone could remember. Ours was one of a handful of families who survived the tsunami that wiped out the original coastal town of Baler in 1735. My father, Juan, he studied to be both nurse and dentist and met my mother, Juana, at the Philippine General Hospital. My mother was from Maritina, Rizal. Together, they returned to Baler to serve the only health professionals in our town for some 20 years and more. In the pre-war days, they delivered every baby and attend to every sick town spot. I was the sixth of ten children. My own father delivered me from my mother's womb. A stream of townsfolk filled our living room from morning until dusk. People looked to my parents for both health care and medicine. Most could only pay in kind, chicken, eggs, a basket of greens. No one was turned away. We had only an elementary school in town then. To reach it, I had to walk three kilometers every day because our home was on the outskirts of town. When I came to the big city to study at Roosevelt High in San Juan, I still walked to school, looking every inch the provinciano that I was. But I say, or I saw these details of the life we led, neither as a mark of poverty nor as a sign of backwardness. Ours was simply an austere life in an austere place. Education was our only wealth and the opportunity to learn we never, we were never deprived. Our home was also our first and earliest training school or ground in public service and our parents are first teachers. It was no surprise that all took a profession strongly oriented towards service, social work, medicine, dentistry, nursing, engineering, law. And that subsequently, we all work in the public sector. That is why I credit my parents for my greatest advocacies and values. They instilled in us the importance of learning and the virtue 
of a compassionate character. In an environment alien to thrills and excess, I first learned the essence of being a scholar and unbiased to strive for excellence and to serve without reservation. There may be as many stories of individual journeys as there are graduates here today. That you got here in the first place is already a success. Name a few days. Only a handful of Filipinos, 15 out of 100, managed to obtain a college degree. All 4,000 of you here today may very well be our country's new generation of illustrators, the enlightened Filipino middle class. Many of Pandit has extolled the virtues of the middle class. The wealthy cannot be relied on to be always altruistic, while the poor are often powerless. It is then up to the middle class to grow the economy and nurture a caring national community. It is the middle class that is associated with more education, better health, better infrastructure, better economic policies, less political uncertainty, less wars, less civil and ethnic strife that put minorities at risk, more social modernization, more democracy. That is the middle class. It is from the ranks of the middle class that innovation, productivity, and entrepreneurship emerge, where values of investing in human capital and accumulating savings begin. Above all, it is the middle class that promotes good governance and the efficient delivery of government services. Aristotle himself noted that the best political community is formed by citizens of the middle class. But first, we must establish who belongs to the middle class. Most economists define middle class statistically based on either income or expenditure. But we do agree to be defined based on your capacity to spend $2 or $100 or $20 or $1,000 a day. Our own statistical agency's efforts to identify and define the middle class came only several years ago. Who then belongs to the Filipino middle class? The official definition, those with an annual family income of from 282,000 to 2,296,000. Families whose heads have a college degree, those who own a house and lot, although this is arguable, those who own an oven, an air conditioner, a car. Based on this definition, would you count yourselves among the middle class? Or would you rather be identified as belonging to the enlightened by virtue of your education in this revered institution? Certainly a definition is important, and especially now, a definition is important, if only to sound an alarm. The Filipino middle class is vanishing. Let me repeat that. The Filipino middle class is vanishing. During the past 30 years, a globalized IT-driven world narrowed income gaps. That's true. Narrowed income gaps between countries. But it also widened inequalities within countries, within the Philippines. The rich are getting richer. The poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is being tightly squeezed. This is palpable, even without the statistics. 
Let me illustrate. The share in national income of the richest 1% in the United States, in the UK, Germany, France, the most advanced Western countries, and even Social Democrat Death Sweden has been increasing since 1980. There are 421 billionaires in the United States whose combined net worth is equivalent to 10.5% of their gross national product. In stark contrast, American workers, if their wages were adjusted for inflation, would be earning less today than they did in 1970. But let's come to our backyard, to our own homeland. The wealth of our own 40 richest families last year grew by an amount equivalent to 76.5% 76.5% of the growth in our national income, in the growth of our land, of GDP. And there are very few of these wealthy families. They number less than one, one in every 100 of us. 20 in every 100 Filipinos belong to the middle class and 80 are poor. And every year the poor increases because 3 in every 100 middle income families slip back into poverty. The absolute number of the middle class may seem enormous. For instance, in the whole of Asia, they said 1.9 billion have graduated into the middle class as of 2008. But this number only serves to mask their vulnerability. If you live just above the poverty threshold, a single stroke of fate, an accident, a calamity, a crisis can send you falling through the cracks. No wonder unrest has swept the world. For while ordinary people may have lost their jobs and their incomes, unrestrained corporate greed has been bailed out. And it is the middle class that has been leading the protest, calling for change. I, I tell you this not to dampen the celebratory mood you have every right to feel. I have, however, I believe that a UP graduate prepared a challenge to a pep talk. So I will not pass up this opportunity to pose one or several challenges to you. You'll be entering the real world, I believe, in a critical time in our history. In two years' time, 2015, the Philippines will become and will go into an integrated ASEAN economic community with nine other nations with a market of 600 million people and a collective gross domestic product of nearly two trillion US dollars. This regional economy will be the ninth largest in the world, a force to reckon with in global diplomatic, political, economic, and cultural competition. The ASEAN economic community will transform 10 individual nations into a single market and production base. Beginning 2015, Filipinos should find it easier to get a job in Singapore or in Malaysia but so does an Indonesian or a Vietnamese. Coinciding with ASEAN integration is our country's entry into its demographic window. I repeat that, demographic window. From 2015 to 2050, a 35-year window we will have a proportionally larger working age population 
and fewer children and the elderly dependent on that working, on every working Filipino. This is the demographic sweet spot that could propel us toward unprecedented progress and wealth. If we capitalize on this demographic dividend, we will be able to finance our own growth from our people's own savings without having to levy additional taxes or borrow from other nations' savings, investment for the people by our own people. However, this opportunity will also come. It's not unique to us, it will also come to many countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. But the, the essential point is, this is our chance. This is the developing world's chance, our chance to catch up with the developed nations. Whether we indeed make that great leap forward depends on whether we build and expand the likes of you, an enlightened middle class. The reality is we are created neither equal nor born equal. And inequalities have measurable impacts on our individual lives. Inequality in life expense expectancy at birth already translates to 15% to reduction in an individual's income. Inequality in education spells a loss of 13.5%. And most hurtful of all, inequality in income spells the loss of 30% in an individual's potential. And that's why a Filipino family's economic status more than any other factor determines over 90% of the time whether a child gets fair access to basic education, primary and secondary education. How then do we level the playing field? Let me suggest some measures by promoting equal access to development opportunities for all, regardless of socio-economic status. By equipping everyone with the opportunity to develop and use his talents and skills productively, meaning give him jobs, give him an opportunity to earn. By fostering broad-based growth that will not only lift people from poverty, but more important, give them lives of meaning and dignity. In the end, as the illustrators of our revolutionary period have shown, a strong middle class is our country's greatest source of talent and potential. A strong middle class is the backbone of civil society, the bulwark against democratic decay, and the motive power of our people's progress. A strong middle class is the voice of reason that moderates vested interests the force of change that compels societies and governments to invest in their own future. But does the middle class know who it is? Whether these new illustrados will be aware of their identity and conscious of their social role will depend on your leadership on the leadership of, of this new middle class ministrados. You hail from an institution of leaders and game changers with a proud tradition of excellence and service. You must be nothing less, achieve nothing less. I have, I have tried to lay before you a vision of the future a future that is your generation's opportunity to seize. Regard this not as a burden, 
but as a mission. Remember that the only way you will justify the hard work you have accomplished and the sacrifices of your parents and be worthy of your country's investment is to live a life of purpose, a purpose greater than yourselves. Congratulations, young graduates. Make us all proud.